I want to talk this morning about saving our children and saving my children. I know I've been talking, Ashley has been talking to me quite about this topic as she and Brian eventually think one day about having children. And the worry, the worry of, uh, am I just bringing a child into the world to be lost? That concern. And I think that, that's probably one of the biggest concerns on the mind of a Christian parent is saving their child. That is, I want to bring a child into the world and I want to, uh, that child to make it to heaven. I think that's a huge concern. I think that's a huge concern when you're young and you witness people fall away. You see some children that other members have fallen away of wherever you've been a member or whether, wherever you grew up. And that starts to worry you. What about my kids? And even when you pick up the Bible, uh, unfaithful children are in the Bible too. Even among some of the Bible's heroes. Adam and Eve. Their son Cain. It's interesting, God deals with Cain, and God talks to Cain in Genesis 4, and corrects Cain, and motivates Cain, and says, hey, if you do well, you'll feel better, Cain. And then confronts Cain after the murder, and punishes Cain, or gives the punishment, you're not going to die, but here's what the punishment is going to be. And in Genesis chapter 4, and verse 16, then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and I, I interpret that, that at that point in Cain's life, Cain says, that's it. Me and God are done. And we never really hear about Cain again as far as any conversations with God. I don't think that's just a geographical sort of term or whatever, that wherever Cain was talking to God, Cain left that area or whatever. To me, that, that's Cain's determination. God's not going to be part of my life. I'm not going to listen to God. And I just, no interest. And that's it. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. And then you have come to the rest of the story. It didn't have to be that way. Even after Cain murdered Abel, Cain could have said, God, I'm sorry, I repent. I know nothing I can do can make up for this, but I know you accept a contrite and broken heart like David said in Psalm 51, and I can't bring my brother, brother back, but for the rest of my life, I'm going to dedicate my life to you. That's the way the story could have been. But it didn't turn out that way. Later on in Genesis, we have another example here. In Genesis chapter 26 and in verse 34, Isaac and Rebekah have Esau, and Esau was 40 years old, and he marries two Hittite women. And in verse 35, they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. And, and I don't think it's merely because they were Hittite women, because we have Uriah the Hittite, who was a very faithful man in David's time. I think it was they were Hittite women, and they lived like the culture of the Hittites, and they were ungodly women. And... That was hard for Isaac and Rebekah. They don't have the same values, Esau. I mean, getting, getting, around, getting around and having a family meal is kind of hard when you have two women now who don't have any of the values that your mom and dad have. That causes some problems. One of the ones I think that catches us by surprise is Samuel. Is... As I look at Samuel, I mean, other biblical heroes, you see flaws in their life. David has his flaws, and Solomon has his flaws, and Peter has his flaws. I don't know if I really ever see any flaws in Samuel, and one of the most discouraging passages of Samuel, what an excellent example, and, and never has any period in his life where he goes astray. It says, his sons, however, did not walk in his own ways. And I don't know, and, and that's one of those things I think, that's a passage I think that does bother people when they think about having children of, man, if Samuel, if Samuel, faithful Samuel, couldn't keep his sons faithful, what chance do I have? And we have kings, we have people like Manasseh, who follows a very faithful father. A number of the kings that Israel had, they had faithful fathers, but... The son was not faithful. And one example there would be 2 Kings chapter 20 and 21. Yeah. 
The Bible, though, equally acknowledges that it's a very common temptation to depart from God and from the faith. And so, first of all, it's not a, it's not a great accomplishment. You're, you're not accomplishing anything great by leaving the faith because it's common. It's something a lot of other people have done. It is something that the proverb writer, Solomon, writing in the book of Proverbs to a son, continually talks about and is a theme, especially in ver- chapters 1 to 10, is just a continual theme. We start in verse 8 of chapter 1. Hear, my son, your father's instruction. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. And it's just not the mother. It's, it's not that, well, that's what your mom says. It's what your mom is saying is what God is saying. What your father is saying is what God is saying. Your parents are godly people. Chapter 3, verse 1, my son, do not forget my teaching. Let your heart keep my commandments. And not just because they're mine, but because actually they're, they originate with God. They're God's commandments, so I'm just telling you what God's commandments are. Hear, O sons, the instruction of a father. Give attention that you may gain understanding. I give you sound teaching. I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm giving you sound instruction as New Testament. I'm giving you sound doctrine. My son, chapter 5, verse 1, Give attention to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding. And I think the inference is because it's God's wisdom, it's God's understanding. In chapter 7, verse 1, my son, keep my words and treasure my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. And it seems like there's just an urgency in the Proverbs. An urgency from a father to a son that the son would remain on the same path. But here's something that young people need to think about. And I think about this with Cain, going back to Genesis 4, is we're, we're going to talk mainly to the parents, but we're also talking to the kids, is that you have to think about, you have to think about your future family. If I depart from the faith, what do I have to offer my kids when they have a question? What am I going to give them? What wisdom am I going to impart to them? When they go through the trials of being a teenager or when they, go, when they go through the ups and downs of a new marriage or when they have their kids or when they face whatever it may be that people face, what am I going to have to offer them? With God, with God, I've got God's wisdom to offer them. I've got prayer to offer them. I've got the support of a congregation to offer them. I've got eternal truth to offer them. I've got salvation to offer them. I've got the hope of eternal life to offer them. But if I turn my back on that, what do I have to offer them? I remember I reading a poem about, Billy Collins wrote a poem about that he, uh, his mother had given him life and strong arms and legs and a body. His mother had given him a mind and a heart and had given him nourishment and cared for him every day of his life. And he went off the camp and made a lanyard. <laughs> made, made, made a, that well, a lot of us made in junior high, made a white and red lanyard. Here, here's your lanyard, mother. That makes up for everything, doesn't it? If I depart from God, all I've got to offer them is a lanyard. A little key ring holder. I think about that when, when you look at Cain's family. Cain goes out from the presence of the Lord, verse 16, and then you read about his family. You don't read really anything else about Cain. Find, he finds a woman to marry him. He goes out. He settles down. He has children. And then he kind of passes off the scene. And then among his family, you have Lamech, who has two wives. And you have all sorts of technology. And you have Lamech saying, if a man kills me, I'll take vengeance on him this many times. And Cain never thought about what his family would become. And when you're young, you need to think about that. What are my kids going to be like? What are my grandkids going to be like? Because I'm all part of that family, and I, that family never leaves me. That, that's with me for the rest of my life here. Genesis 19. The same thing is true with Lot and the two daughters of Lot. Lot's two daughters have, the, have Moab and Ammon and they, became, they become, along with Esau's kids, the enemies of God's people. If, if I depart from God, am I assigning to my children and grandchildren a position of being an enemy of the gospel? 
Because that's what Lot's grandchildren became. An enemy of Abraham's offspring. Uh, there's enough unbelievers in the world that I don't need to produce any future unbelievers or enemies of the gospel. That's something I would think about. As, and Malachi chapter 1 through 3, you think, see that with Esau. Let's go a little farther here. All right, some things for parents. This is probably one of the most, the most difficult things about being a human being and being a parent is to be consistent. And you're not going to be consistent all the time. But what this means is that the, you're the same person in public as you're in private. And what that means is that in your home, there's no profanity. You and your wife aren't swearing. You're not calling each other, you're not cussing at one another in the family. You're not cutting each other down in presence of the children. So there's no profanity in the home. Or, or dad doesn't come home and he just swears or whatever blah, 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 this day. And there's warmth between the parents. And there's a love for God's people in the home, like 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, love the brotherhood. And there's morally upright forms of entertainment in the home. And I know, and I know that's getting more and more difficult at times. The difficulty sometimes is not the show. You can kind of look at what the show is. Okay, I can watch that show. The difficulty is the commercials. That's the difficulty sometimes. And, of course, the one that I always laugh about is all the medicines they're advertising and then the side effects of those medicines. And I still don't know what a de de delayed backache is. Whatever that is doesn't sound good, but it seems like a lot of medicines, med well, delayed backache, that's one of the side effects. Here's a passage I want you to consider. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. I like the passage. And, and the passage is all about being the same person all the time. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That thought, that... You've always obeyed, and in my absence. If I'm going to save my children, I have to be the same person I am in public. That person I'm, I'm in public, that example I'm sending in public, I have to be that way in private. Same speech, same morals, same values. Uh, same conviction, same warmth, same example. The second thing, you know, the elections this year, uh, some of the debates talked, talked about walking the walk. And the original, the original, you know, talking the talk and walking the walk is James chapter 1, verse 22. Prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. And you can delude yourself. Now you're, now, you're not deluding anyone else, typically, and, and you're not going to delude your children. And you're not going to fool them if you're not walking the walk as a Christian. You have to practice what you preach, especially in their presence. Kids can spot hypocrisy probably better than about anything else. In parents, they can't necessarily spot it in the world but they can see it in their own parents. Which just means that you need to have your own... Now, regular Bible study and prayer does not simply mean that you're here at Bible study, and that's important. By regular Bible study and prayer is, I, I think your kids need to see you outside of this location, in your own home, opening your Bible and reading it. I think one of the healthiest things would be a child to come home from a date, or a child to come home from work, and mom or dad... There they are, and they're reading the Bible. And, and that, that, that's something that they see consistent, consistently throughout their growing up years. You know, mom and dad seem to read their Bible quite a bit outside of an assembly. They, they might be doing their, Bible, their Sunday morning Bible study. They might be doing their Wednesday night Bible study. But often what they were doing is they were just doing their own Bible study. They might have been doing their daily Bible reading. But 
God's word was really, really important to them. And prayer, not only, not only just prayer at a meal time, which is important, but the kids knew that mom and dad frequently would go off and would have times when they would pray. Because maybe they would say, in, in just a passing conversation, you know, honey, I was praying about that today, or I was thinking about that, and I went to God about that, and we were thinking about that. And that so many decisions, prayer was part of that decision. And then extending hospitality, and faithfulness and worship, and involved in saving the lost. I think that's an important one. I think something happens to kids when they grow up, they grow up, and they hear their mom and dad talk about how important the gospel is and how important God is. And, and they hear mom and dad talking about how important all this is. And yet, if they never see mom and dad really reaching out to anyone who is lost, I think that tends to undermine, undermine everything mom and dad is saying. Well, mom and dad, if the lost are so important, and if Jesus is the only way, then why don't I see you really ever reaching out to try to save anyone who's lost? I mean, kids think things like that. I mean, it's, if this is it, then shouldn't we be living like this is it? And rejoicing in your hope. That they see you joyful as a Christian. They see you excited about going to heaven. They see you excited about worship. They see you excited about opening up scripture and reading it. As David said, oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. They see that. They see the excitement in you about God and the things of God and serving God. And here's something. They see that you're different. My mom and dad are different than other mom and dads. And I hope they see that in a good way. That is, when they go over and maybe they spend the night at someone else's house. When they interact with other parents at school. When soccer or little league or whatever. But they interact with other parents. And they come home and it dawns on them. I've got parents that are different than most of my other parents. Classmates, my parents aren't like most parents. They're different in a good way. And here's something I want you to look at. I think this would be a good exercise in Galatians chapter 5, 19 to 21. First of all, put yourself in your child's shoes and do they see any of those qualities in your life right now? Are you, are, are you impure? I mean, do you, do you kind of have a, a dirty head? I mean, oh yeah, dad, dad has a dirty mind or he has a dirty mouth or whatever, etc. Do they see any idolatry in your life? That is, you know, that car means everything to dad. If dad lost that car, he had... I mean, do they see you loving money? Do they see you loving possessions? I mean, is there any idolatry in your life? Or, or would they say material possessions, mom and dad enjoy them, but that's not their life. I mean, they could also live without those things. And if your kids were asked, what's the most important thing in your what's the most important thing in your mom and dad's life? Would they say, Well, God. God's the most important. And then each other. And then we're like, we're third. <laughs> you, know, you know, dad loves God first, he loves mom second, and he loves us third. The way it should be. And mom should be the same way as well. Do they see any strife in your life? Do they see jealousy? Neighbors get a new car. Uh, any jealousy there? Any jealousy about other members of the church? Any outburst of anger in your home? Disputes, envy, or do they see this list? Love between mom and dad, and definitely love for them. But it's, it's agape. It's, it's, of course, mom and dad have filial love, and they have agape love, and they have all the loves. They have all the loves their mom and dad have. But they know mom and dad always operate in my best eternal interest. I know that. Joy. I mean, mom and dad happy. Peace. Peace. Do they see patience? 
Do they see patience like in spending and finances? Well, we're not going to buy that until we can afford it. Do they see kindness with their words and actions with their neighbors? Goodness. What would they say, mom and dad, mom, are, are mom and dad at the end of the day, are mom and dad good? Well, yeah, they're good. Through and through, they're good. And they're gentle, and mom and dad are self-controlled, and dad is self-controlled. Which list? I think we're naive if we think that I can have this, and I can be lacking some of this, and I'm still going to save them. I don't think that's, I mean, I mean, there are kids, there are kids that are going to make it to heaven in spite of bad parental example. I know that, Ezekiel 18. But I'm not doing them any favors if I'm not especially having that list in my life. Equally strong parents does not mean that the parents agree about everything the same. That doesn't mean that, all right? Parents are going to disagree, and, and beware of that. Now, I want to pause a little bit. I want to pause a little bit about um, that whole thing. Uh, there are so many passages that emphasize, emphasize the need to maritalize, be linked up with someone spiritual on the same page you are. One reason back in Deuteronomy chapter 7 for that is you find in verse um, 3, don't intermarry with the Canaanites. Verse 4, they're going to turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. There's that danger, but, but there are so many judgment calls in parenting. Uh, curfews. One they can date. Um, and a thousand things you never thought about as a, as a parent. Just judgment calls. Those judgment calls, and, not, and two equally strong Christians are not always going to agree on the judgment call. And sometimes those judgment calls cause friction in a marriage. Because mom, oh, I like this, and man says, oh, I don't know about that, I'm thinking this. And, and so mom and dad, what you don't realize is that as a, as a child, when you mess up as a child, automatically now your parents have to deal with that, and sometimes your messing up as a child causes friction between mom and dad because mom and dad have to sort it out and decide what an appropriate punishment is. And now they're, they're kind of odds at one another because they're kind of debating, like, what should we do? Well, I think, I think we should ground them forever. No, well, no, we can't do that. You know, I think we should do this or, or whatever, right? Mom and dad. And that's true of two, Christi two parents that are Christians. By equally strong, it's hard to convince your children that God should be first if one of the persons in the parenting team is not putting God first. And I'm not, I'm not just talking about, well, both parents need to attend services and things like that. That's not being equally strong. Because I think sometimes the kids can tell which parent, which parent is going and which parent is being pushed. Which parents go in the services and which parent is being led. And that's what I mean by equally strong. That is, both mom and dad need to be equally spiritual. Where if something happened to mom, dad would say, hey, we're still going. Or if something happened to dad, mom says, hey, nothing's changed around here. We're still on the same direction. It's just that dad has gone ahead of us. But, but nothing's changed about the plan. The plan is we're serving God and we're still going to heaven and we're going to be there every Sunday or whatever and, and that sort of thing. That's what I mean by equally strong. Now, I want to talk about a passage. I'm going to go to the Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon. And I want to look at a... This is a conversation we have at the end of the book. It's a conversation among some brothers about their little sister. And it's in Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs 8, chapter 8 and verse 8. And they say, we have a little sister. What shall we do for our sister? on the day when she is spoken of. If she is a wall, we shall build on her a battlement of silver. Okay, a wall. But if she is a door, then we're going to barricade her with planks of cedar. 
I love that passage because I think there's a number of young men in here who can identify with the passage, especially if the little sisters adore. Because I don't know if you ever had a little sister, but a lot of times older brothers are very protective about their little sister, especially anyone who's coming to date them. You know, and they will say, hey, you know, who are you? And what are you up to? And what are your intentions, young man? And they will say things like that. And I think that's what we have the brothers here. Now, what does it mean to be a wall? What's it mean to be a wall? And what's it mean to be a door? Well, here's some things I came up with. A wall says what's right. What is right? What's right? A door said what's easy. A wall says prove it. Someone says, well, this is true. A wall says prove it. Prove it. A door is easily swayed. Well, I guess that's what they say is true, so I'll just go along with it. A wall stands alone. If it needs to, a wall will stand on God alone if no one else will stand on God. And a door is more concerned with where, where's everyone else standing? I don't want to stick out. A wall will say, I listen to that music because it's appropriate, but I like it. Uh, a door will say, well, what's everybody else like? A wall will say, God says... A door will say, what do they say? A wall will say, is it true? A door will say, what's popular now or trendy? A wall will say, am I respected? I want to be respected. A door says, I want to be popular. A wall will say, fear God. A door fears everybody else. And which one are you? And parents, which one are your children? Here's something. I was thinking about this the other night. I was talking to Ashley about this. And we were talking about a number of kids we knew that did not stay faithful to God. And, what, and, and it dawned on me, and this may not be true in all situations, but it dawned on me that a number of these kids all had one thing in common, or at least something I thought they all had in common. That is, all these kids that had not stayed faithful were followers, and they weren't leaders. Is my child a wall or are they a door? Am I a wall or door is a door? Am I a wall or am I a door? The world wants us to be doors because the world makes a lot of money off of doors. Especially door children. Door children have to have all the games everybody else has. Door children have to have all the music that everyone else has. You know, I got to have the new computer, I got to have the newest. Door children are big spenders. A wall says, either I can't afford it right now, or I'll save up for it, or I don't really need that, or I don't need the latest and the greatest right now, or I've got enough of that already, or I can wait. The world makes a lot of money off of door adults. Walls are not appreciated because walls, like in Steve Wallace's series, a wall will say, when someone says, well, this is true, a wall will say, really? Prove it. In a college class, a wall will say, prove it. Give me the facts. Give me the evidence. Let's see it. Really? Really? That's what a wall will say. A door would you? oh, I guess that's what they say, so they say. And a wall will ask questions. And a wall wants the truth and not just the easiest path. Parents, you have to look at your kids and you have to say, okay, are they a wall right now or are they still a door? If they're still a door, then I'm going to probably need to put some extra fences around them, some extra rules around them. One of these days, hopefully, they'll be a wall. But right now, they're a door, you know, I remember, I remember Zach and Kiki, uh, would, would, when they were little, would watch commercials, and the commercial would be on some, one of these infomercials, and it would be on the, uh, it would be some slick product, and it would, it would make your car look like new, and Zach would say, Dad, you need to buy the, you know, the, the, the whiz bang, whatever thing it was, and I'm going like, oh, you know, you're going like, you're going, you know, don't believe those commercials, none of those things work, or whatever, but that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's a door. 
Okay, that's a door at that point as far as, no, 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 that's, we need to be more of a wall here. Don't just believe everything they say. And, and so I think at certain times in your kids' lives, you have to say, okay, are we at the wall yet? Are we still at the door? And then parenting and curfews and things like that will depend on whether they're a wall or whether they're a door. And kids, I want the kids to listen right now. The more you're a wall, the more privileges you get. The more privileges parents are going to reel out, the more that you're a wall. The less that you're a wall, the less privileges you're going to get. So you can't complain of, my parents don't let me do this, this, and this, and this. Well, because you're a door. You're acting like a door right now. That's why. If you want freedom, if you want privileges, then start acting like a wall. And you'll... you'll uh, They'll start reeling them out. So, hey, they're a wall. We can let them do this, this, and this. We need to make wise sacrifices. When they're young, we need to be active. We need to be in an active and strong congregation. That's, that, that doesn't always happen. But that's something as a, if, if I have new children, that's something I'm thinking about. I want them in a congregation where there's a lot of kids. Now, when I'm older, when I'm older, maybe I'll be working with a congregation that's small, that doesn't have as many kids, but that's something at least I'm thinking about from my perspective, at least when they're young, I want them being around other kids their age. Uh, I want to organize classes for their age group. We have a new group of high school kids, and they just snagged the front row, didn't they? I noticed that this morning. The previous generation with Zach and, and Garrett, and that generation there is on the second pew, and there's the new, there's the new generation. Okay? Well, what, what needs to be done for that new generation is that things that need, need to be organized for that. When, when I have kids in junior high and high school, I need to be part of the group that is organizing things for that age group. And I need to limit the amount of time that I'm away from them. And I need to have regular and deep spiritual talks with them, and the situations will arise. And I need to make sure I don't turn a blind eye when they start making some false steps in the wrong direction and just optimistically think, well, they'll just turn it around by themselves. I need to stay involved. I need to be serious about the right things. Convictions over convenience, God's law over my opinions, my marriage over my career, uh, worship over hobbies and homework, honoring God and obeying him over everything else. That's the clear message I need to send as a parent. John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Smart fellowship, basically, as we close the lesson, there's a passage over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. It's a passage that talks about having a member in the congregation there at Corinth who was in sin. Paul is saying you need to deal with that. That is like having leaven in your congregation. That's like having leaven that's going to leaven the whole lump. And that's verse 6. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Verse 11, he says, I wrote, do not associate with any so-called brother if he's immoral, covetous, an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, swindler, not even eat with such a one. We need to remember that our kids are part of the lump. They're a lump too. Rebellion is no big deal if there's no social consequences. And we, we read that passage, and there's this passage as well. And uh, what we, I mean by this is that we need to be wise as far as fellow, fellowship is concerned. I know sometimes that we may have relatives. They may be non-Christians or they may be unfaithful Christians. And I think it's very important that when you get together, that your kids at times need to see, as Seth Thessalonians talks about, they need to see you being vocal about your faith. They need to see, like in verse 14 of 2 Thessalonians 3, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that man and do not associate with him. And in verse 15 it says, admonish him as a brother. Make sure your kids see that. If you're around someone who's an unbeliever and they're vocal about their unbelief, or if you're around someone who's an unfaithful Christian, they need to see your admonishment to that individual. And you need to stand up for God. And the last slide here is be vocal about your faith. Preachers are to be in season, out of season. 
parents need to be in season and out of season as well. The gospel must not be silenced in our homes. Be courageous. You know, Derek talked about the passage here in Acts chapter 24. The sermon topic was righteousness, self-control, the judgment to come. One of the things that sometimes worries me in certain homes when a child does become unfaithful is it looks like mom and dad get silenced in that home. That's not true of all homes. But that's something that worries me sometimes in a home where one of the children is no longer a faithful Christian. That is that the home becomes very quiet about God and Scripture when that person's around. I think if anything, if anything, if you got someone in your home that's an unfaithful Christian, if anything, you need to turn up the intensity of your conversations about God. You need to let fellowship take care of itself. And by fellowship taking care of itself, it means you need to be so vocal about your faith that someone who's unfaithful either repents or they can't stand to be around you. That's what I mean by letting fellowship take care of itself. I am so vocal about being a Christian. I'm so optimistic and positive about being a Christian. I talk about the gospel so much that the only people that want to be around me are people that either are interested in pursuing that and people who aren't say, I don't want to have anything to do with Mark. They say, all he talks about is God. Instead of being concerned about offending someone who's not faithful, everyone needs to be concerned about offending mom and dad and... God. If anyone has to tiptoe around the house, the unbeliever needs to be one tiptoeing. And that's our lesson this morning. I want to talk about the plan of salvation. If you want to become a Christian this morning, you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ. You need to repent of your sins. You need to confess your faith in Him as the Son of God. You need to be immersed, baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. If you want a passage, Acts 2.38. Repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Now, we've got a baptistry behind here. And there is water in it, and it's, it's pretty warm. Now, it's not really, really hot, but I just anyone here vi- visiting may might, might have thought of, well, when does this group do baptisms? Well, number one, they're not saved up. There's no special day to be baptized because we don't find that in Scripture. What we find in Scripture is at the point a person believed that Jesus was the Christ and it was changed in their life and willing to confess Christ, at that point they were baptized, whether it was midnight or whatever. So whenever you're ready to be baptized, you give myself or someone else here a call. We'll do it that very hour of the night. Whatever your need is, let us come as a stand and sing.